I'm from LA. I love Los Angeles. Um, it's home to me, you know, but uh, a lot of other cities get a lot of um, notoriety for being um, great design cities, you know, San Francisco, Chicago, New York, um, and a lot of people love to write Los Angeles off, but um, I feel like it's important to recognize and honor your environment because um, the design environment around us really um, informs our human existence and it really kind of um, <clears throat> informs our day-to-day -day experience. Julie and, this is my wife Julie, Julie and I live um, in the uh, Eastern Columbia building in downtown Los Angeles. We moved there about an hour, uh, a year and a half ago designed by Claude Bielman in 1930. And uh, it's great to live in an area surrounded by so much humanity. We used to live in an area with um, a lot of nature and up in the hills, but now living in downtown, it's, it's exciting to see a lot of people out on the street and be able to see that from your window, but also be surrounded by design and by art. And um, this is what it looks like inside. That's my star employee, mm -hmm. uh, Dig the Dog. Um, but. Uh, it's been really exciting and refreshing to um, live and work in Los Angeles. But like what I was saying on the, um, the slide with the, uh, the John Lautner building, the chemosphere, you know, all of that environment um, design around us shapes our daily experience, it defines our culture and life, and um, really informs who we are on a moment-to-moment on a -moment daily experience. So. <laughs> But that leads me into my work with these guys, uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And since this conference is about process and design thinking, um, a little bit about the process and design thinking on this. Um, 
This was uh, a big record for the Chili Peppers um, back in 1999. I think this, I don't have my notes up in front of me, but I think this sold 17 million copies globally, worldwide. Um, and uh, what happened in this case, you know, that's a sketch from the lead singer, Anthony Kiedis. Well, I showed this to my, one of my students or a class of my students and, and they thought I was a hack because I just kind of like, kind of exactly dutifully executed, you know, the sketch. It was actually a dream that John Prashanti, the guitarist in the band, had that um, there was a pool and the water was in the sky and the sky was in the water. But really, it's about how you execute the problem that the client brings you and, and how you solve that. In this case, um, John Prashanti, the guitarist, had taken a, um, a leave of absence from the band for a couple of records. This was the first record in a long time that he was back. This was the first record in a while that Rick Rubin was back. So it was, it was a big return to some of their earlier and more epic rock records. So I wanted in translating what this vision was, you know, this to feel like a real epic classic rock record from the 1970s. So that kind of explained the, um, the big kind of bold color, the small type at the top, the like a turn to a 1970s classic album cover and it's always gratifying gratifying to see your client happy with um, the end result here's them with a the cake version of the record um, but it came to me to understand that it's the realization that it's not my record it's their record and it's their art and um, it's our purpose as a designer to faithfully as you can um, translate what their art is through design um, so it really is about you know listening to um, their their needs in this in this case it's not maybe as formal as you know all the um, uh, analysis at the Natural History Museum but you know listening to what John's dream was and um, executing that as as faithfully as possible um, and then it's fun to see uh, your work propagate in culture you know this is a Lego version mm -hmm. of the album cover. But, um, you know, design problem solving is, for the music industry, is pretty much the same as design problem solving in any industry. You know, they, they come to you with certain needs, certain problems. There's always the issues of the deadlines. This, the, the record project actually turned out to be kind of a year-long project um, because even after the record comes out, there's all these singles that they keep releasing out into the, um, into the marketplace. And uh, almost always the due date for the single was, was late, you know, that they, they needed this single kind of like immediately right away. And, and I'm kind of, I can't believe um, that I'm this old now. By the way, um, not to say, John Bielenberg was one of my teachers at California College of the Arts back in 1993. So it's awesome to be here with him. But this was also at a time um, that was uh, pre-Google image, you know, pre, pre you, when you had to like do image research, you had to scan images out of, you know, uh, uh, books and, and alter the photos so you could hide the fact that there was already a halftone moire in the picture. And um, basically that's why there was so much um, posterization in this. So I could kind of like take photos from multiple sources and, um, make it, you know, make it kind of sell psychedelic and, and like the music. Um, but for each single, there was always kind of um, this call from the band where, you know, there was this idea where like Flea would say something like, oh, well, there was, uh, I'd like a single with an eagle eye on it, or let's have a single with um, uh, uh, an apple with a bullet going through it. Or for this single, I want a single of a, a motel. And, and for, for the last single in the cycle, the record, um, that was for a song called Road Tripping, which is about um, the band um, taking a road trip up in Big Sur. So, you know, throwing out a lot of typical ideas for that. You know, let's show um, Big Sur, let's show the road trip and things like that. And, and finally, Anthony Kiedis came back to me. I think the call is patched through through Europe. And, and he told me that there was, um, what he wanted to see was a wolf in the city um, in a city urban environment because instead of us going on a road trip to his area, the wolf comes on a road trip to our area. I'm like, okay, well, 
let's work this out, you know. So we're, you know, looking for pictures of wolves and looking for pictures of cities. And, and you know, in the earlier versions, um, it had really worked out that we did this kind of, you know, Jimi Hendrix psychedelic thing. And I thought that would be great because, you know, we have to hide the fact that the wolf and the city are from two different photographic sources. And, and you know, we, we were, were really late and we um, execute a bunch of different options. And every option that he's looking at, you know, it's, it's you know, Anthony keeps coming back to me and he keeps saying, um, you know, it, it really doesn't look like the wolf is in the street. It's really not believable that, you know, I'm, I'm getting that the wolf is on this road trip um, <laughs> to our city, you know, and it's just like, you know, Anthony, I'm telling you, man, the only way that you're really going to be able to execute it is if you actually get a wolf um, and photograph it in the city. So there's no Photoshop here. Um, that we, we, and then we, we auditioned the wolves um, <laughs> because they, you know, for the, uh, I mean, I want to be mindful of time, but for the original album cover, you know, we had auditioned hundreds of pools across Los Angeles. Again, this was before websites for location companies. This was before Google image search. That meant like getting like the legal size boxes of location folders and, you know, combing through pool after pool after pool until we found the perfect pool. It actually ended up being a pool of a childhood friend of mine. Um, but it was very important for, for Anthony that, the, that we honored the spirit of the wolf uh, on the set. And uh, this, was, um, this was Two Socks from, from Dances with Wolves. Um, and uh, it's definitely, and that's on Grand Avenue. Uh, things in, in downtown LA, things get really uh, weird once you start dealing with wild animal permits and the ASPCA um, in, in an urban environment. And also, um, I don't know how many of you have been around real wolves before, but this guy was like, you know, like a bit yay high, you know. So I was actually on the other side of the street, you know, kind of. <laughs> Once the trainer gives the like the no sudden movement speech, you know, that kind of like changes, um, you know, kind of things. But you know, this here's a, a quick eye shot of a lot of the music stuff that I've done, and and it's really fulfilling to do work in the music industry because it puts your work at an intersection of culture where hopefully um, you're creating something that has a, um, an impact on people's lives personally. You know, music is a big part of our life. Um, it's a part of our life when you fall in love, when you, when you lose a loved one, at times a triumph in your life. Um, so to have a role in helping um, extend that experience in the human experience is what for me is really fulfilling as a designer who, who does work in, in the music industry. And, and you see that music is a big part of the human experience in the form of songs of protest um, and the, in advancing uh, culture and the arts, in hopefully advancing ideas for peace in humanity. Uh, and um, this, I did not design this, this of course is Peter Saville for Joy Division, but you know, I'm showing this because it's, it's uh, fascinating to see the way the album artwork resonates with people personally and resonates with our culture. And when you see album artwork um, have an impact on people individually and creatively, you know, to me as a designer, that's what is one of um, the most important parts of, of our jobs, uh, making that connection and contribution to, to humans' lives. And you know, as we get to this day and age when, when our entire music libraries can fit in our phone, um, I, I start to ask, you know, what is really the experience of that? And, and how does that change? Yes, it's great to be able to listen to any song you want absolutely at any time, but how does that change the artistic experience? Um, what is the, where does the impact of the album artwork uh, go? And how is that different from being able to search, collect, to hold, to touch, to actually be in the physical presence of the artwork? And it actually affects the experience of the listening to it. You may have the advantage of being able to listen to anything at any time on Spotify, but actually taking the LP out of the sleeve, putting the needle on the record, listening to the album, looking at the artwork, possibly reading the liner notes while you're listening to the record, it's a completely different experience. So what we do is, is about hopefully extending that artistic experience, um, much like, you know, 
when you're looking at a Mark Rothko painting, you know, it's about being in the presence of that artwork and, and, and the proximity that the individual has to that and how that um, changes your experience of the art. Um, and it makes me think a little bit about um, a person, well, Charles and Ray Eames, that I take a lot of inspiration from but um, taking your pleasure seriously. And, and gearing up for, for this conference, I was thinking a little bit about design thinking. This is Dig Again, taking pleasure seriously on our, on our own Eames chair. Um, but uh, the, uh, the Eames is really thought about um, evolutionary design rather than being revolutionary. Here behind in the background is, is, are the famous Eames leg sprints, uh, splints. And uh, the thinking that came behind from this, you know, it was, it was about a process of listening to the needs of what the design problem um, posed. Here they had a friend that was a, um, a, a medical officer in the U.S. Navy in World War II. And they, they found out that um, the soldiers on the battlefield, their leg injuries were actually getting more damaged getting carried off the battlefield in the um, uh, metal splints than, um, than the actual injury themselves. So in responding to those, uh, the parameters of that design problem, they um, had recently invented the molded plywood technology and um, they applied that thinking to uh, the invention of the leg splints and that in a long way was a large part of the start of um, the Eames office because they got huge orders for all these leg sprints, splints for, for the U.S. Navy, which really led to the thinking um, for something like this. So it wasn't like the Eames started off like, hey, let's design a super cool chair out of molded plywood, but it was really that kind of evolutionary thinking um, in the reverse where it's really about you know, form following function. And um, for us, a large part of the time, you know, the form follows the function of telling the artist's story. I mean, Eames talks a lot about this Indian vessel called the Lota. Um, it's a water vessel, and it, in, in it being the perfect design because you know someone could come along and add handles to it um, and, and, and make it more ornate or make it more complex and, and make it have lots of things on it. But you know, um, it serves its purpose perfectly in this configuration. And in a way, it, it is the most perfect design. So, you know, listening to the needs of the parameter of the project is, is, is one of the um, core principles that I like to lean on when I'm uh, looking at inspiration from um, the Eames. And, and uh, that story of um, listening to what the client's objective is all about and uh, their work is, is all about is, is a large part of what informs my work for the band Wilco. I've had a 17-year working relationship with the American Alternative Band, um, and uh, they're based out of Chicago. And uh, here's, a, here's a little quick look at some of the stuff um, that, uh, that I've done for Wilco. And, and Wilco, to this day, to this weekend, to actually do Monday, uh, is, um, is, is still a client, so. Hold back, oh, don't invite me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, two, three, someone said nine. So in the case of Wilco, we have a scenario where they came from a band called Uncle Tupelo uh, that was actually based out of St. Louis and it was um, probably like 20 years ago. And at the time, um, it, it was a style of music called uh, like roots rock or the alternative, kind of a crossover between where country and alternative music. Um, crossover and um, a lot of the visual nomenclature that style was a lot of 
cross-process photos and sloppy borders and rusted train tracks and brick walls and roots growing in between cracks and showing like kind of the gritty um, jangliness of the music. And um, Wilco took a very much inside their art and inside their music a decided turn to make their music more about um, the art and make it more of kind of um, uh, not necessarily about being a, a pop band or, or making a hit. Much, in fact, the lead singer Jeff Tweedy will joke himself that you know they've never really had a huge hit, um, but it's really about um, making art that's true to who they are as artists. So visually, the intent was always to reflect that as much as we could. Um, this is a photograph by Justine Parsons. She shot on four by five uh, fine art photography format. And so it was a real conscious decision to say like, hey, let's step away from the classic fisheye band lens, black and white sloppy borders, um, and let's move towards a style of fine art um, that really reflects what um, the music is all about, or hopefully the design reflects what the music is all about. And then expanding from the design um, one step further so that um, we have a crisp, clean design style that um, elevates what the photography is all about, that elevates what the music is all about. And so it's a type of piece where um, when the listener comes in contact with it, ideally it feels like it's a, um, a special artistic piece. And, and that really, the intent there is to, um, to reflect the spirit of what um, the, the poetry and the music of, uh, of Jeff Tweedy and the band. Um, and then, our work for their probably their most popular record, Yankee Hotel Foxtrot. We took that thinking even uh, further on maybe even a little starker on the design. We featured um, the Bertrand Goldberg building, Marina City Tower is on the cover. It was, it, you know, th a lot of the process on the Wilco design um, will go through 300, 400 covers uh, in the development uh, over the period of weeks and months um, to, to finally get to where we were. And, you know, we had a lot of designs that were a lot more complex, but it, you know, turned out that sometimes the most restrained and simple solution is the best solution. Um, but uh, a lot of people in Wilco now, in Chicago now, which is where they're from and where these buildings are at the Michigan River, on the Chicago River at Michigan Avenue, you know, it's common parlance to call this these the Wilco Towers. Um, and it's, it's kind of fun to see that to have a reverse impact um, in, in the culture because they are very much hometown heroes. But um, in hindsight, it kind of made sense to me. It wasn't maybe at the forefront or it's coalesced in my mind at the time, but you know, these buildings are very much a part of Chicago yet like no other architecture in Chicago. And in a lot of ways, that's very much like Wilco. They're, they're very much a part of Chicago, yet like no other band um, in Chicago. And Bertrand Goldberg was, was an architect very similar to that type of principles, always kind of going against um, the grain in a city famous for, you know, Mies van der Rohe and the skyscraper and the Sears Tower. <coughs> you know, he's using rounded forms and things like that. And Jeff Tweedy, has a, a really sweet story where after one of um, the concerts, the grandchildren of Bertrand Goldberg came up to Tweedy and, and they were telling him that how proud their grandfather would have been that you know his cover was on the, um, his building was on the cover of the, the Wilco album. Um, but uh, you know, they, they are very much a part of Chicago and Chicago informs a lot of what their music is about. And um, so in the artwork, it's important for us to um, reflect their environment and, and what being in that environment is all about. This is the um, titling sequence we did for the documentary um, I'm Trying to Break Your Heart, which is a documentary about the making of uh, Yankee Hotel Foxtrot. Um, and over the course of the years with Wilco, you kind of get the chance to build an ecosystem that kind of goes over the whole arc of everything where, you know, each piece is different, but still there's that same intention that, you know, this is about reflecting um, the, uh, the tone of their, their music, the tone of the art, uh, that there is this gravitas to it, um, that they are a different type of band. And, you know, ideally 
um, the artwork uh, reflects that. The uh, LAX theme building there, that is a, a triptych of three different posters um, for a concert series they did in Los Angeles where you could only get all three if you went to all three different concerts. They were all in different theaters um, in Los Angeles, so and then you put them all together, which I've seen on the internet. Some people have the whole suite, so it's nice that people do that. Uh, and then you, you know, a large part of, it, of, of, of the design for music experience is seeing the fans um, connect with the artwork and having that resonate in the community. And, and this is a picture from Solid Sound, their, their music festival that happens um, once every two years. And it's actually taking place in um, just about two and a half weeks, June 24th. Uh, it's at Mass Mocha in, um, in the Berkshires up in uh, Massachusetts. And um, what's nice about that is you see um, them, uh, the, the festival overlapping with the entire community in a way that has a large impact on the community financially and culturally. You know, as you're driving into the whole area around Mass Mocha, you see houses, just regular houses that have signs on their front lawn that say like, welcome Wilco fans, you know, and it's a real kind of community thing that um, the, the band gets involved with, the whole festival gets involved with, and it, it's, it's really heartwarming to see, you know, your design um, helping extend, extend that idea. Come on in, you guys. Design. This, is, this is design. Uh, and they have a whole um, constellation of brands and partners that, that get in on the experience, you know, um, creating a whole kind of um, family of products that, that kind of extend um, the experience. A lot of local um, makers, uh, Stumptown Coffee, Mass Brothers Chocolate, Langunitas Brewing. Um, so it's, it's a way... I mean, it, it kind of, uh, I was thinking about this during Kim's talk when you were talking about the dinner party, Kim, that um, it's, it's a way of um, having the cultural experience be more than just about the visual and having it kind of cover to all, um, all senses. And the, the whole festival ends up bringing in about um, $2 million to the local economy, um, which is nice to see that impact um, manifested in, in, in ways that does make a difference for a small town in the Berkshires. There's Julie, um, the kind of, uh, it, it is this whole festival though, um, family experience. Um, and then these are all photos of um, the catalog that we did, the field guide that we did, all taken off of fans' Instagrams. So again, a huge fulfilling part for me is seeing um, the fans appreciate the work and, and having that um, appreciation, you know, f reflected on something like Instagram or, or um, people's Facebook feeds. Um, but more than um, just a calendar or a schedule for the festival, um, how can we make the guide, you know, more purposeful? Uh, this year we did this, um, a page that people write on and they're going to add it to a wall uh, that's part of kind of like a Wilco timeline. So, um, and of course, then there's the um, solid sound golf pencils that go with the, um, the field guide. So it's, it, you know, we, we're always trying to look for ways to um, make it more than just, you know, a calendar or a schedule. Um, and then these are the chocolate bars that we did with uh, Mass Brothers Chocolate out of um, Brooklyn. So they're deconstructing our logo for the um, uh, wrapping paper. But um, taking it one step further, uh, we did this golden ticket with the Mass Brothers Chocolate. That's Nels Klein, who's the, the guitarist for the band. And this kind of makes me remember uh, another key part of, of our design process is it's important for it to be fun and for us to um, inject you know, humor and playfulness and surprise uh, into the, the design experience. Um, and, and hopefully that reflects and resonates um, with the people that we're um, trying to connect with. And that playfulness and discovery and surprise um, ideally is also reflected in um, the album artwork package. But going back to the Spotify screen, you know, you want to make something that people 
uh, enjoy opening, that, that there is a sense of discovery uh, up on the, uh, the holes where it, the letter form O is, you know, those are die cuts. So when you, actually, wherever there's holes in the art, artwork on the outside slipcase, those are die cut out. So when you, when you pull out the slipcase, um, all of that changes. And there's just a real sense of like being able to open all the panels and, and discover more and more artwork. So you want to make something that people cherish, that um, this is the physical extension of the music artwork itself. This is the, the part of the music that people get to touch and to hold and to keep. Um, and that it's more than just an uh, MP3 file on your, on your iPhone. And then just looking at the whole um, constellation of, of things that we've gotten to design for, for Wilco over the years. Um, so each time we approach a piece, it's, um, it's always different. And you look at the parameters of that specific project. But um, over the 17-year arc, there, there is kind of a thread that, um, keeps, that you keep coming back to because you know, the content of the band is the same. And, and you want that same kind of um, specialness to be evoked in everything that you do for them. And a little bit more about my process. Um, I mean, I, I, my process on each project changes from project to project based on what the parameters of the project are, because I'm going to show you some of my social action work that um, is very different from my music work. So I don't have a set process to um, how I approach each project. But I do have a set kind of exercise that every morning I sit with this journal for um, a committed t 10 minutes and just write down, you know, who am I speaking to? Why am I speaking to them? Why is it a privilege to be a designer? Um, and uh, the gratitude that I have for hopefully being able to make artwork that um, elevates the human experience, that connects with people, that hopefully um, enriches people's lives on um, a day-to-day -day level. So, um, I mean, to me, that's the most process, um, most consistent process thing um, about, about what I do as, as a work. But moving on to um, the social action um, so if this is work for um, Heal the Bay, which is Southern California's uh, in clean water advocacy or, and education organization. And, and a little bit like what Kim was talking about in her talk, in a lot of these institutions, you do get resistance to change. Um, and uh, we, w we came in for a, a kind of a complete refresh on a lot of their visual elements, and, and we wanted to uh, create artwork that um, you know spoke about the problems of of keeping Santa Monica Bay clean, but also um, engaged the base and made artwork that was bold that would um, that the, a, a high school student would feel excited about you know engaging with. Um, but you still have to honor the um, the educational initiatives of the institution, and um, it, it, it is hard to. Um, enact change in uh, an organization that has so many different um, initiatives. Uh, in the case of the Clinton Foundation, that's me with the client up in the uh, upper right there. Uh, you know, the Clinton Foundation, more of a challenge um, because they do a lot of great groundbreaking work uh, in the world of like clean water in Africa and, and um, a lot of great um, initiatives throughout their whole foundation. but very resistant to having progressive design um, in their work. So this was more of a, um, a challenging um, case. Uh, there was a funny story that um, we, this was for a big benefit concert celebrating the, the 10th anniversary of the, the, Clinton, um, the Clinton Foundation. And they wanted the shot of the Hollywood Bowl, of course, the photograph that we had to get of the Hollywood Bowl was from a concert prior to the concert that we would be giving this out at. So, you know, I sent a photographer to a Fish concert. They, they really wanted, we did hundreds of mock-ups, you know, with Danny Clinch photos of people at the concerts, and they wanted that joy and jubilation and people's hands up in the air. And so, so the photographer went to, and got the concert photos of people's hands up in the air, and there was all these different hands, and, and, and one hand, they were blurry and one hand kind of slightly maybe vaguely looked like anyway someone at the client uh, the Clinton Foundation 
felt like someone was giving the devil sign. And, you know, I got this email that, like, please remove the devil sign. Uh, devil worship is not part of the Clinton Foundation uh, <laughs> initiatives. So that was just kind of like, okay, I've reached, you know, critical mass on the, um, you know, of course, devil worship is not part of um, the Clinton Foundation, um, their, their initiative messaging. But um, this is for a, um, a uh, national service initiative that was through the Entertainment Industry Foundation and, and the White House. Uh, so we're getting to be a little bit bolder with the graphics and uh, in, uh, calling on people to participate in their communities and, and do more social actions. So using the letter form of the I as the I in participating and again, it, it's always fulfilling to see um, the artwork actually um, in play. You know, with here we have Mayor Bloomberg uh, giving the announcement of the initiative at Times Square, and then you know, utilizing the power of celebrity um, in the artwork. You know, with Gwyneth Paltrow, with Faith Hill, Morgan Freeman, and, and Matthew McConaughey, and then um, work we did for the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. Uh, and again, you know, exciting to see Vice President Al Gore uh, engage, utilizing, you know, what the logo is for. Um, this is for the institute that, that um, stands for all the sciences at UCLA um, and um, sustainability. So there's policy, there's education, and there's, um, you know, enforcement of the um, sustainability throughout the UCLA campus. And, and I, I did give a very similar talk to this uh, at the Dallas Society of Visual Communications in a hotel across the street from the George W. Bush Presidential Library. And just about this point, when I, now I've gotten Clinton, Bloomberg, and Al Gore, I could, I could hear like, you know, kind of a lot of seat rustling, you know, that they, they had like this California Democrat, you know, and, um, but um, just um, design, listening to the fact that, you know, the Institute encompasses um, all sciences for uh, UCLA, all environmental sciences, and, and just trying to um, design a mark that, en that encompasses all that, but also um, integrates with the pre-existing um, UCLA brand nomenclature. Um, and then this is work that we did for um, Brad Pitt's Make It Right Foundation, which used, which employed uh, high profile architects and progressive architecture in rebuilding homes in uh, New Orleans, lower, lower Ninth Ward after Hurricane Katrina. So um, just trying to develop graphics that reflect the um, progressiveness of the architecture and um, the enthusiasm of the initiative. And, and there were a lot of people that, you know, um, objective to, um, them bringing in such flashy architects in an area that you know has so much heritage and history, um, but uh, you know the the purpose of the, the graphics for the film that we designed was really to kind of um, reflect the spirit of uh, that progressive thinking and the architecture. Uh, and then this is a project that we recently um, completed for James Cameron's environmental organization called Food Choice Task Force, which. Uh, it works towards encouraging people to migrate to a more um, plant-based plant diet and um, just using uh, engaging design to um, get people to notice that, it, you know, a lot of, um, th that you could use design to get them to, to look at uh, not just vegetarianism, but, but looking at it in a, in a more um, fun, engaging, conscious way, and, and the logo that we um, designed for them, just the task force moving forward, and all the, um, all the printed materials for the, for the institution as well. And then this is um, the political action uh, arm of that foundation. And the case here is to design something that um, speaks to all Americans, you know, not just environmentalists, not just, um, but also people, uh, Republicans, Democrats, uh, people in, in, in middle America, on, on all coasts. So um, trying to engender a spirit that, you know, 
eating healthy is um, and and a more plant-based diet is something that would um, also help protect America and protect America's resources. Uh, this is what the ad, the New York Times ad, actually ended up looking like uh, because they kept on adding more and more signers onto uh, the initiative. Um, this was an open letter to uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the, uh, the Secretary of Agriculture. And uh, they just kept adding more and more names. You know, we were really, we were working through the weekend um, and they just blew through every deadline um, up until like the very end of Sunday night um, where uh, the ad had to ship to the New York Times. We did the New York Times, the Washington Post and Politico. And then uh, even after uploading the ad to the New York Times, um, they changed the list of signatures three times the next morning. Um, and, you know, as designers, you know, we've all uploaded files to any printer all the time. But when you're uploading to, for a full page ad for the New York Times, uh, your finger kind of quivers on the mouse click send button a little bit more. That's a $200,000 ad buy. So uh, it, there is a little bit more weight to clicking the button that says send. But um, even after I had to change the ad three times, and this was at six in the morning Los Angeles time because it had to be there at nine in the morning um, New York time. Uh, and they, they, after they changed it three times. I say as a designer, you really haven't lived until you've had the, the pressman call you from the floor of the New York Times, mm -hmm. just saying like, it's like Polly Cicero from Goodfellas, like Lawrence Azarad, I'm like, yes, you know, just, <laughs> you've changed this ad three times. <laughs> Can you guarantee that you're not gonna change this again? Yeah, my wife was actually in the room when she was like, who are you talking to? I said, yes, sir, I promise, you know, of course, like, <laughs> You're guaranteeing a two hundred thousand dollar ad buy, you know. So that that's you know um, definitely got my morning started, you know. And I, you know, when you see the phone ring and it say the New York Times, and and you know he's calling from the press floor, you can hear the press in the background. It's just like, okay, let's let's not go through that one again, you know. But um, but then these are the memes that we designed for. Um, uh, the, the, the same cause. And, and, you know, 7 million people, uh, this actually got 11 million impressions across uh, the internet. And uh, I'm not sure how many people saw the full page New York Times ad, you know, but um, it's interesting looking at uh, the effectiveness of the reach on the digital media versus, versus the print media. And then the power of celebrity for the work that we do with Stand Up to Cancer. Um, but we try to bring um, this kind of rock and roll energy to our social action work and our, our, our music work too. And we, we also try to bring the same level of consciousness in our social action work to our music work. So both of them are about um, making an impact on humans and, and, and you know, enriching our culture uh, as much as we can. We, we're Red Bull is a client, they do a concert series. We're, we're in the middle of a new engagement with them on this. It's a 30 day concert series in Los Angeles across a whole different spectrum of music from punk to pop to rap to, to hardcore, um, very hardcore rock to hip hop, um, the Juicy J um, with the jet airplanes on the stripper pole, that's uh, hip hop. You know, this is all about telling the story of each different artist's music. That's actually uh, Oprah's jet on the stripper pole there, so um, for, for Juicy J. But, you know, each illustration, these were posters and used, later used uh, as street snipes um, is really just trying to, you know, convey to the viewer um, what is this music about, um, what's the spirit of the culture. And um, this year, since the concerts are all in different venues all across Los Angeles, um, we're looking at a theme of distance and community and that we're all in this community together culturally and, and that um, there's more together, that there's more that brings us together than separates us. Um, and, you know, getting to see the, the music work in, um, in, in situ, as they say. And then supporting uh, Record Store Day through art. Um, we did a series of um, posters for record stores across uh, the country. Uh, we have the Colorado ones reflecting the Red Rocks made out of vinyl LPs. <laughs> Um, the, um, you know, for Austin, you know, turning the record into the tortilla, you know, and you got the bats from the Austin Caves and Austin Bridges. 
and Atlanta getting the whole Hot Atlanta Records thing. But one of my most personal projects is a design history of uh, the supersonic airplane, the Concorde. And to me, going back to the Eames idea um, and the way that the design thinking um, affects humanity and affects our lifestyle, you know, this is truly a case of form following function where um, what the, the supersonic airplane could actually do dictated um, the actual shape um, of, of the aircraft. You know, it wasn't like, hey, let's set out to design this sculptural, beautiful airplane that looks like a swan, but it was really much about, you know, like the, the physics and um, the purpose of what the airline, the airliner was supposed to do dictated the actual design of it. Um, and uh, the more I learned about what Concorde was about, the more fascinated um, I became with it. But, you know, but basically it flew twice the speed, uh, more than twice the speed of sound, but definitely twice the speed of a regular aircraft. So wherever you were going on a regular airplane, just cut that time in half, which is you know, what Concorde did. Uh, and to me, that was about um, using design thinking to help advance humanity and very much in a similar way to the thinking behind like the Apollo program, let's get humankind to the moon. Um, if you look at you know, human travel from you know, wind-powered ships to steamboats to propeller jets to the jet airplane to Concorde, you know, bringing humanity closer to each other, bringing the world closer to each other, making the world smaller, the, that's the time that it would take for Concorde to go from New York to London. Uh, so just under three hours. Um, and, uh, but it was really came out of that kind of aspirational era of you know, Tomorrowland, that you know, in tomorrow, the future will be better, the future will be faster, we'll be able to go um, higher, and very much a part of um, the jet age and jet culture. You see that reflected in similar themes in um, architecture. Again, you have the LAX theme building, Aero Saarinen's TWA building, and Saarinen's um, Dulles uh, building, and then, you know, like the Frank Sinatra, Come Fly With Me, just all this kind of fascination about jet culture, and this is, you know, the, the advancement of, of humankind. Um, and what happened, the, uh, it, uh, I know we're kind of wrapping up on time, but um, without getting too much into the whole story about Concord, you know, there were going to be hundreds of them, and you would, we we're going to be able to fly, you know, United Airlines, American Airlines, Concord, and the U.S. was building one, um, and they didn't want the Europeans to kind of gain superiority in the supersonic world. So uh, once they kind of put a block on that, um, all the airlines dropped their orders for Concorde. And the two national airlines that, that built Concorde, Air France and British Airways, they were stuck with like these 13 aircraft. So the economy this, of scale really didn't work for them. Now you had these like 13 really expensive and exotic troublesome aircraft like super Maseratis. So they tried to make it about the experience and you ended up having this flying club where you had you know, celebrities, George Soros, Prince, Sheiks, Harvey Weinstein, Phil Collins did a, fav a famous stint where he played Live Aid in, in England and then took Concord and played Live Aid on the same night in um, America. You know, the Queen, the Pope, Sting, Maya Angelou and um, what happened socially is you kind of got this flying club that doesn't exist anymore and it was this kind of like rarefied social experience um, and uh, then they use design to elevate um, every touch point of that experience so Raymond Lowy designing the silverware Andre Putnam designing the um, airplane cabins Terence Conran designing the Concord Lounge at Kennedy that's a Christian Lacroix menu. Uh, so it became much like at the beginning of the dawn of the jet age, this complete comprehensive um, design experience for the passenger where really design kind of um, elevated the entire travel experience, which is very much not what it's like uh, today. Uh, and it really kind of enthralled um, the popular culture. You know, here up in the upper right is Roger Moore and Moonraker uh, as James Bond taking Concord and just you see it kind of in movies and um, captivating uh, popular culture. And what happened was, the, you know, the Concord crash wasn't even Concord's fault. Uh, it, it ran over a piece of debris left by another airline and, and that kicked up into the plane and, and caused the accident. And they spent millions of dollars 
um, thick lining the fuel tanks in Kevlar and bulletproof vest material. Um, and, and the very first day back in action for Concord was the first 9-11. So um, actually while that flight was in air is when the planes went into the towers. So when the, that plane landed, people were coming up to the Concord with the phones saying like, this is happening. But economically what happened at, at that point, you had that break where Concord was out of service and all of the Concord's core customers, you know, like your George Soros's and your Mick Jagger's and, and all that, um, they migrated to private jet. So it was really kind of like the beginning of the end for Concord. But, you know, it was that experience where like Paul McCartney would lead sing-alongs of Beatles songs on, on, the, on the plane. You know, Andy Warhol would regularly uh, steal the silverware. Uh, Harvey Weinstein got caught smoking cigarettes in the bathroom. And um, I got to, on my 30th birthday, I went, this is my Hockney collage from my trip on Concord. And, and um, it is kind of wild to, to fly to New York um, in, in, in faster than a bullet. It, it flew faster than the actual rotation of the Earth. So um, you could get to your destination before you left where you left Whoa. local time <laughs> you know scientists would use it to um watch eclipses because you could beat the sun you would see the sun rise in the west if you were flying um westward i was flying in the opposite direction so um you'd see the um earth turning like someone was spinning a globe and it, it's hard to see with the lights on this is actually um, my picture from out the window, but you're also at 60,000 feet instead of 30,000 feet. So you, you can see the curvature of the earth and you're actually at the troposphere. So the sky is black and you get this kind of like global sense. And uh, from Concord, if you saw a, a regular airplane flying in the same direction, 30,000 feet below you, that airplane would appear to be flying backwards, you know, because you're flying twice the speed of that, you know. But they did all kinds of stunts where like a 747 would take off from Europe and the Concorde would take off from America, go to Europe and then come back to America before the 747 got to America, you know? And of course they're like French and smoking cigarettes and laughing the whole time, you know? But um, it was this kind of retro futuristic object that always remained kind of futuristic. And then I happened to collect all of the ephemera um, kind of surrounding the whole Concord lifestyle and, and everything um, designed for it kind of had this um, aspirational, um, futuristic, even, you know, engaging children in toys and, and just like, you know, the future is here and, and we're all going to like go everywhere super fast and every, everything is going to be better for it. And here's a little glimpse of some of the art from um, my personal project on, on that uh, and a little exhibit we, we did on that where we gave away Concord sleep masks and um, the development of the book that we're doing um, to, uh, you know, show this closed chapter in um, design history. But, you know, to me it was appropriate to show today because it was really very much about design thinking, um, uh, advancing humanity. But personally it's important to um, have a personal creative life raft uh, in, in this personal project. And then the, the website for the project, which is up, which is uh, supersoniccite.com. So um, on there, oh yeah, there's a little movie from what it was like. Oh, I don't know what I did. Well, that's the end of the talk, actually. I did jump to, but... Uh, the, we did some silk screens up in up in the end there. Thank you.
So, and, um, and then the, uh, some silk screens that we did on, on the project too. So just uh, expanding it to all, uh, all different aspects of the project and just really having fun with it. Um, the sleep masks and the, the Concord silk screens. But it's important as a designer um, when you're working on the other projects to, to have a personal creative life raft, which is, which is all about what it is. Thank you, everyone. So, um, any questions about um, Concord or Social Action or Wilco or Red Hot Chili Peppers or? Where are the Concords? What do they do with those? They're in museums, John. Um, there's one at the Intrepid in New York on the uh, the deck of the aircraft carrier. There, there's a couple in the Pacific Northwest, like because that's where Boeing is. Uh, one thing I did mention that the, there is the American one. Boeing, Boeing was making a bigger one. Of course, ours was going to be bigger, and uh, that's also in the museum up there. It was very much a like the space race thing, where like Kennedy literally said, "I want to beat that bastard De Gaulle," and um, the Soviets made one, and the Soviet one was actually made it out first. Uh, there was all this like cool es uh, industrial espionage and everything like that. Um, but um, the, the, the US one is, it was up there too, so. Why didn't uh, they use any of them? What happened was after, the, the, after it came back and then the 9-11 thing, it ran for another like six years and um, the manufacturer, which became Air, uh, Airbus, but it was built before Airbus was Airbus. After a certain amount of time, they said, you know what, we can't guarantee the airworthy. I mean, they were, they, they were constantly being re refurbished. They were actually like very like safe, probably yeah. the safest yeah. airline you could be on because yeah. they, were, they were taking such well care of. Yeah. But um, at that point, the two air, they, were a lot, they were money losers for the two airlines. Richard Branson wanted to run them for Virgin. But Virgin and British Airways had always had this like horrible, um, yeah. So British Airways was just like absolutely, and and Branson wanted to do like the back seats would be um, internet tickets yeah, yeah. like cheap, yeah. and then the front would be like crazy Virgin Atlantic right. super service right, style. Right. But um, I do remember when I went on it, I mean, it was beautiful and the bathrooms were like designed by tomato design and real towels and um, real roses. But, but there was also an aspect when I was walking on the plane, right when I was walking on, it was like, whoa, this is like a 40 year old airplane. You know, this is kind of like a little, you know, yeah. just I hope it was oiled up today yeah also when it, it it takes off really fast and lands really fast so it's a little a little more white knuckly you know yeah. i mean it's basically like a fighter jet with a yeah. hundred people in it so yeah yeah what did the gold ticket get you oh a free ticket to solid sound oh. and there were five of them just like in willy wonka <laughs> so um if you found it you were lucky <laughs> Well, the chocolates were just, oh, they, were the they were in the chocolate. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, just like in Willy Wonka. <laughs> and they, they were, they really, there's a video that when Nels Klein is putting the tickets in, and they really went randomly out to like oh. stores across America. Yeah. So, I think so. I think so, yeah. I don't know if you had any like Augustus Sloop <laughs> situations where people were like buying like 500. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, but Wilco's constantly doing like, fun partnerships like that, you know, with like coffee companies and things like that. So, yeah. So you bring up the digital music, um, analog music kind of conversation, and, and I guess this is more a common look at your take on it, but, so you know, I remember middle school listening to punk rock music and buying CDs and, and cassettes and actually reading along the lyrics, right, because mm -hmm. they were in the booklets, right? 
Nowadays, you don't get that when you download something or stream something. You know? and I mean, there is a PDF, but how fun is yeah, how yeah, fun yeah, is reading a PDF, know, right? I've actually downloaded MP3 albums with a PDF. Yeah, so, but I just feel like talking about Kim's comment about sensory and, and heighten your sensory with the more you cover, so you have the audio, the visual, the tactile, all that stuff. Now you just push play, and so I guess where I'm going with this is that because, for example, my work, you know that type of genre of punk rock really influenced a lot of my work. I'm just wondering if music today has that same effect when, you know, a young 20-something year old just pushes play on their Spotify app, you know, because they're not getting that box, they're not getting that sleeve, they're not, I mean, so I, I'd love to get your take on, like, you know, do musicians know this and are they uh, redesigning or kind of reconsidering what they write, how they write, you know, and I'm just a, Oh, well, that last part of the question changed the whole question, for, well, which I is really interesting. It changed because now that I'm talking about it, I'm wondering if now musicians are understanding and realizing that it's, they're no longer pushing out a lot. Of, or at least, because I'm a musician, the whole vinyl with um, rebuttal, you know, kind of that one movement these days. Um, I don't know. Just a, no, I think I could answer that concisely uh, in just two real quick parts. Um, I think that there is a trend now to make more specialness in the actual physical thing, even though it's for a smaller amount of people. Like Silver Sun Pickups is a client. We're working on their new record. This is our second record with them. And Monday we're doing a LP, the actual vinyl, that's going to have flecks of color in it on colored vinyl. That's going to have an etching in the vinyl. Then everyone always points to the resurgence in vinyl, um, although that's a niche of a niche. I mean, it is trending up but it's not what it was when that was the only way you could get music of course but it is promising to see the return to the interest in the physical thing but more to the second part of your question bands and artists are more cognizant of needing to um, make some type of visual experience in some way more engaging than just the mp3 so you'll see things on video online, on, um, on YouTube, where um, just different levels of engagement on websites and things like that, where, um, you know, I, I, the package is gone, but the experience of art and music will never go away. It's just kind of migrating to another type of format. So um, the, the, there's always a need for that intersection of the fan and the music, but, um, now they're just finding, and, and in some cases, using technology in a more adventurous way than just the package alone. Um, I can't cite any examples at the, at the second, but you know. Um, well, still big videos. I mean, the video is, is, has less importance because that, well, I don't know. I mean, it, we, back in the day of MTV, it was hugely important as a, as a discovery um, stream. But now it is, I mean, it is the Wild West. It, it's, it's great how the internet has made everything more democratic, but now that it is more democratic, there's so many more people in the pool that it takes a lot more, I mean, a lot more to get noticed. So, I mean, Justin Bieber got discovered as a YouTube star mm -hmm. sensation. So, um, but uh, it also gives, the artist the chance to do something completely adventurous that would never be shown on MTV. So, um, but I think the traditional format for videos as far as MTV, I mean, MTV is like Teen Mom and the um, Jersey Shore now, you know, so. Well, thanks, you guys. Thanks, Just, yeah, yeah. <laughs>